How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is topic 14, applications of covalent bonding, where we look at sigma and pi bonding, and then five and six electron domains. Let's go. Okay, 14.1, higher level covalent bonding. We look at sigma and pi bonds. We look at uh, molecules with five and six electron domains, and then we talk about Vespa theory as well. So the IB understandings and applications and skills focus around what is a sigma bond and what is a pi bond and how they're formed. And then we also have to talk about things with five electron domains and six electron domains. And then we want to be able to write the molecular geometry, which is the shape and also the bond angles for those species. Okay, so remember the Pauli exclusion principle that an orbital can contain zero, one or two electrons. Where there is an overlap of two partially filled orbitals, we form a covalent bond. So if we have two orbitals from two different atoms containing one unpaired electron, those things can merge in a region of space which creates a bonding orbital between the two atoms. So if we get two s orbitals which look a little bit like tennis balls and they overlap, we would form what we call a sigma bond. Now for this, this could be like two hydrogens coming together and overlapping, their 1s orbitals overlap. If we have the p orbitals, the p orbitals look a little bit like dumbbells and we have px, py and pz. Now we could have overlap between a 1s orbital and one of the two p orbitals and that would form a single bond as well. That could be something like a carbon hydrogen bond. Now if we get two, if we want to form a sigma bond, we have end on end or head to head overlap of atomic orbitals. So if we get two px orbitals and they overlap, we create what is called a sigma bond. A sigma bond is a single bond. So we can see here that the region between those two orbitals is where the bond would form. That results in electron density that's concentrated between the nuclei. A pi bond is formed by sideways overlapping of the atomic orbitals. So we could have two 2py orbitals and eventually they would get close enough together so that the orbitals overlap both above and below the plane of the nuclei. So the nuclei are like this and the orbitals are above and below the plane of the, or of the atoms. So it's called sideways overlap of the orbitals. Now when we have sideways overlap of the orbitals, this results in a pi bond. A pi bond is a double covalent bond. For a pi bond to occur, we need to have the end on end of the sigma and then the sideways for the pi bond. So if we wanted to form a single covalent bond, what we have is, for instance, two 2px orbitals, both coming together and both overlapping end on end to form a single or sigma bond. So that's the formation of a single bond, the end on end or head to head overlap of orbitals, which forms a single covalent, covalent bond. If we want to form a double covalent bond, well, we've got both the head to head overlap and then the sideways overlap. So we've got two 2px orbitals overlapping, and then we've also got two 2py orbitals overlapping. So we've got this double overlap going on. That means we've got a sigma bond, and a pi bond, the pi bond giving the sideways overlap. Now that looks a little bit like the image to the left, the hamburger, where we have the meat in the hamburger being the end on end overlap, the sigma bond between the two atoms on the internuclear axis. And then the bun is like the pi bonding above and below the plane. If we have the formation of a triple bond, then we've got even more overlap going on. We've got overlap of all of the orbitals. So now what we have is the sigma, end on end or head to head, and then we've got two pi bonds, one coming from the px's, uh, the py's, and the other coming from the pz's. So what we've got here is we've got our end on end overlap in the middle, and then we've got electron density above and below, and then we've also got electron density at the front and the back giving us our triple bond. Now the Vespa theory is the model used to predict the geometry of individual molecules from the number of electron pairs surrounding the central atom. Remember that octet rule is mentioned because it's a special configuration where atoms are said to be stable. Now if we have elements in period three or below, sometimes they could have more or less electrons in the outer shell. So some exemptions for that rule is boron and beryllium. 
both of those actually have less than eight electrons in the outer shell. So they actually have a smaller octet. Now that means they can act as either Lewis acids or Lewis bases, depending upon their electron configuration. Atoms in period three can also expand their octet, which means they would have more than eight electrons in the outer shell. So for instance, phosphorus in phosphorus pentachloride has 10 electrons in its outer shell. And then the chlorine in the CF3 molecule would have 12 electrons in its outer shell. Remember, it's got those valence electrons as well. Some important terminology just to go over from standard level. Electron domains is the number of locations of electrons in the valence shell. Those could be occupied by lone pairs, single pairs, or double or triple bonds. Remember the molecular geometry is the shape of the molecule. Remember the increasing repulsion, lone pair, lone pairs repel the most, bonding pairs repel the least. So now let's have a look at things with five electron domains. So if we've got something with five electron domains, it could have five bonding pairs of electrons. So five bonds surrounding the central atom. An example of this would be PF5, phosphorus pentafluoride. So we have our phosphorus in the middle, and then in a triangular arrangement around the phosphorus, all on the same plane, we have three fluorines. And then we have a fluorine coming out of the plane and one below the plane. Inside the plane, the angles are 120 degrees because it's trigonal planar. And then between the planes, we have 90 degree angles. So we have two angles we need to remember for that one. Now the name of this uh, molecule, the shape is known as trigonal bipyramidal. So trigonal bipyramidal, that is the molecular geometry. Okay, so we can have five bonding pairs. Now, what if, if we can have five electron domains? What if we have four bonding pairs and one lone pair? Well, that's gonna change how the molecule behaves. So for an example, we have SF4, sulfur tetrafluoride. So we have our sulfur as our central atom, and then we have four bonds surrounding that sulfur. Now, I want you to pretend that one of the bonds in the plane is now being replaced by a lone pair of electrons. So we have a lone pair of electrons and two fluorines within the plane in that trigonal planar arrangement. And then we have one phosphorus above, one fluorine above and one fluorine below. Now, if you have a look to the left-hand side, you can see that that looks kind of like a device you might have used when you're a child. It is called a seesaw. Now the angles here, because we've got the lone pair, it will actually push the angles together a little bit. So we have 116 degrees within the plane, and then between the planes we have less than 90 degrees. It's slightly less than 90. Between the two fluorines that are in the, uh, above and below, we have 187 degrees. And it's known as a seesaw. And that's the word you can use to describe its molecular geometry. Okay, so again, if we have five electron domains, this time we might have three bonding pairs and two lone pairs. An example of this kind of molecule is ClF3. So our Cl, it will be our central atom, and it's gonna have three fluorines attached to it. But this time we've got two lone pairs. Now two of those lone pairs, they're in the same plane. And then this fluorine that I've just drawn, that's in the same plane as well. The two other fluorines are like above and below, so they're in a different plane, or they're in their own plane by themselves. So here we have the bond angles of 86.2 degrees between each of the fluorines, and then we have 187 degrees between those two, <coughs> excuse me, between those two fluorines. This is known as a T-shaped molecule. The last species with five electron domains would have two bonding pairs and three lone pairs. An, an example of this is the triiodide ion, I3-, so this one comes with a charge as well. Here we have our non-bonding electrons, our lone pairs, all in the same plane. So all of those are within the same plane. And then our other two iodines are the ones that are like above and below. And here we have a linear structure. So this, in this shape, the electrons would get as far away from each other as possible, and that would be 180 degrees, and it is linear. <laughs> All 
All right, species with six electron domains. So if we have something with six electron domains, we could have something that has six bonding pairs or six BPs. An example of this might be SF6, sulfur hexafluoride, which is a very interesting gas. If you get to play with it, it's kind of cool. Um, and what we have here is we have a square planar arrangement where those four fluorines are in the same plane, like a bit of paper. And then we have two fluorines, one coming out above, one coming out below. We've seen this kind of arrangement before when we looked at topic 13, where we had the transition metals. This is called an octahedral. Octahedral because it has eight faces, not anything to do with the six bonds. All right, so six electron domains, maybe we have five bonding pairs and one lone pair. An example of this would be BrF5. And what happens here is we're getting a square base with one bond coming out the top. So we have our square planar arrangement of our fluorines again, and then coming out the top or the bottom, we have our extra fluorine. This is starting to look like something you might see in Egypt. This is a square based pyramid. Again, all of the bonds will still be at 90 degrees. And the last one with six electron domains would be four bonding pairs and two lone pairs. So an example like this might be XEF4, where we have our two bonding electrons. They're the ones that are above and below the plane. And then our four fluorines are just in the same plane. This would be known as square planar all at 90 degrees. Okay, so that's the easy part. The hard part is when you've got a whole bunch of different molecules and you need to draw them. So this is how we do it. So if we have BrF3, what we need to work out is how many lone pairs there are in this molecule, because that's gonna allow us to work it out. So the way we do this is we look at the number of valence electrons in, in the molecule. So we have bromine, which has seven plus three times seven, which gives me 28 electrons in total in the outer shells. Now what I want to do is find the closest octet. The closest octet is 24. That means I'm four electrons away from the closest octet, which means I've got two lone pairs of electrons. So this molecule will have two lone pairs and three bonding pairs because the bromine's connected to three fluorines. So that means we can then look up the shape. It's going to be T-shaped. The bromine has two lone pairs of electrons and then three fluorines, so it is a T-shaped molecule. You really just need to remember those shapes. Now, would this thing be polar? Well, if we go in and draw the dipoles, we can see that two of the bromine-fluorine dipoles will cancel out, leaving us with one Br to F molecule pulling the dipole down, so that will be polar. IF5, so we go along the same way. How many electrons do we have in the valence shell? Seven plus five times seven, which equals 42. I look for my nearest octet. My nearest octet is 40. So that means I'm two electrons away from my nearest octet, which means I've got one lone pair of electron. So I've got one lone pair and five bonding pairs because I've got five fluorines, which means that I'm going to have an arrangement that is square based pyramid. I've got my four fluorines in the plane and then one fluorine above. So that is a square based pyramid. If I was to try and work out if this is polar, all of the dipoles will cancel out in the plane because if they're ropes, they're just pulling it away. But the fluorine that is below the plane, that will be the only one that forms a small dipole. So that will be polar as well. For CiCl2 minus, we've got to take into consideration that extra electron now. So again, I look for the number of electrons in the outer shell. Seven plus two times seven plus one gives me 22 electrons. My closest octet is 16. So that means I'm six electrons away from my closest octet, which means I must have three lone pairs. So I've got three lone pairs and two bonding pairs, which is going to give this the linear arrangement where I have the chlorines both above and below, and then my non-bonding electrons in the trigonal planar plane. So this is linear. Will this be polar? No, this will be a non-polar molecule. And the last one, D, ICL4, again going down the same process, working out the number of electrons in the valence shell. We have seven plus four times seven plus one, 
which gives me 36 electrons. My closest octet is 32, so that means I'm four electrons away, which means I've got two lone pairs. I've got two lone pairs plus four bonding pairs, which gives me six electron domains. So this one is most likely to be a square planar arrangement with the non-bonding electrons above and below the plane of the bonding electrons. Will this one be polar? Well, the ICLs, they're all going to be pulling away from the iodine, so they're all going to cancel out. So that will be a non-polar molecule as well. All right, volume eight, some top tips. You need to know the shapes and you need to know the configurations for five and six electron domains. Remember the bond angles and remember to calculate the electron domains. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.